There is a current view which is uh, not completely wrong. That's what makes it so dangerous. That all you have to do is to increase expenditure. And that, of course, leads to the use of inflation to secure full employment. But that's only a short-term relief, which in the long term makes things worse. Because what it amounts to is to stimulate certain misdirections of labor particularly in the spirit where everybody wanted growth, it draws more and more people in producing capital goods. And they can be kept employed there only by continuing inflation, in fact, continuing inflation at an accelerating rate. So the dreadful position is that the politicians can always temporarily say, oh, we are going to reduce unemployment by spending more. But in the long run, they make these misdirections of labor only worse and we buy the short-term remedy at the price of greater unemployment later on. Now, we have had the longest period of inflation behind us which this country has ever experienced. And we must expect that a very large proportion of the labor force has been drawn into occupations where they cannot be permanently employed unless we have continuing and accelerating inflation. The consequence is that we must go through a very bitter period of uh, unemployment in which people are <coughs> induced to shift their occupation. Now in a normal market system that works fairly easily because the relative wages indicate where the chances of occupation are. But we have on top of inflation a system where the whole wage structure is almost entirely politically determined by trade unions. So this normal mechanism of relative wages, which tells people where good employments are, no longer works. So I think as a result of a silly policy in the past, we are bound to go through a much longer period. Now, note, the mistake is not the present government policy that's wrong. It's wrong in the sense that they attempted to try again to stimulate it by a little more inflation. The mistake is in the past, and we have to pay for mistakes already made in the past. Well, what, what sort of shifts do you anticipate would take place if we had a totally mobile market responding Well, I think very largely shift away from uh, producing capital goods into producing consumers' goods. But in detail, that's impossible to predict. You know, the whole point of the market price system is that it tells us of an infinite number of particular facts and demands of which nobody knows. We can find out a stable situation only by letting the market work, using these signals which the prices const constitute to draw people into which occupations are really employed, and that would work if we had a tolerably free market. Well, is it, is it a part of your position that um, unemployment compensation is enough of a disincentive to neutralize uh, the force of the marketplace? Uh, I can't speak about this country. I really don't know enough about how important it here is. I mean, the country which I know much better, England, of course, is the main factor. I mean, there you have the ridiculous uh, situation where unemployment compensation is paid to the wives of people on strike. So the people, uh, even if they go on, st on strike to push up for higher wages, they don't run any risk. The government has to look after their families. Now, to a milder extent, I think the same thing is pr probably operating here. But I can't speak very definitely. I mean, the American well, trade union policy is let, 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 let me put the question to you generally. Uh, is, uh, uh, is it a part of your position that the adjustments required to make up for past mistakes uh, cannot, uh, 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 cannot take place alongside unemployment compensation, or is it only when unemployment compensation becomes too, uh, too lucrative? Uh, the latter. Mm -hmm. You know, I have no objection against a flat minimum secured to everybody who cannot earn enough in the market. But the same for everybody on condition that he cannot earn more in the market. That need not interfere with the 
price mechanism with the free play of market forces. But once, of course, you make it more attractive to employ unemployment compensation than to work, even uh, young people who cannot expect to earn more than little when they begin, of course, the temptation to remain unemployment and to earn unemployment compensation is very large. I have no idea, but I suspect that a comparatively large part of the <coughs> unemployment, which is recorded statistically, isn't generally unemployment. It's just a preference of people to draw unemployment compensation rather than to work. How would you account for the almost unanimous opinion of, um, of uh, liberal Democrats that in order to reduce uh, unemployment, it is necessary for the government to pursue uh, vast spending projects. Well, is, 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 is it, is, since you, you, you speak of this as being almost manifestly ill-advised, the question arises why such superstitions should survive. Well, it's almost entirely the work of one man, in a way a genius, Lord Keynes, who uh, was much more concerned about influencing current policy than about advancing the right sort of theories. And he was operating then in a very peculiar situation. You know, in Great Britain, a successful attempt was made after World War I, which brought a good deal of inflation, to bring prices down to the pre-war level. Prices came down, but wages did not. So you had in the 1920s a position in Great Britain where wages were internationally too high and British Britain had become non-competitive on the world market. The problem in Great Britain was uh, to uh, make Britain competitive again, and it was clear that this required a reduction of real wages. Notice these real wages had been artificially increased by increasing the value of the pound. So because the pound was brought to its former level, people receiving the same wartime sal uh, wages of an inflated <coughs> pound could buy much more. Wages had not come down. Now, his first argument was wages must come down. Then the conclusion, that's politically impossible. So we must find another way, uh, instead of getting money wages down, we must depreciate the pounds so that given money wages should correspond to a lower level of real wages. And then by a curious uh, intellectual somersault, I would almost say, he let himself to believe that even bringing down money wages was not any use, it involves a very complex economic argument. And all he said, uh, concluded, was that, uh, well, we must inflate in short. Now, I noticed several things. <coughs> Keynes was a genius, but a genius who spent only a fraction of his time on economics, one of the busiest men I ever knew, but he knew very little economics except the particularly Cambridge tradition, and he was much more concerned to influence policy at a particular moment than develop a th true theory. In fact, the last time I talked to him, which was after the war, I knew him very well. Uh, when I asked him, wasn't he getting alarmed about what his pupils, who had swallowed all this theory, were doing after the war when the danger was clearly inflation? His answer was, oh, don't mind. My theory was frightfully important in the 1930s. So then we needed an expansion to correct the situation. Do trust me, if this theory ever becomes dangerous, I'm going to turn public opinion around like this. Six months later, he was dead. And as usual, what happened is that the very doctrinaire pupils of this man did uh, apply to a completely different situation, a theory which was designed to influence policy in a particular situation. The only thing I blame Keynes for is uh, to make his theory more attractive and defective. He called it a the general theory. In fact, he knew precisely that it was not a general theory, that it was an argument to persuade government in the 1930s to do particular things.